Hi, this is Dr. Kevin Kirby. Again, we're doing the continuing series of uh, tissue stress theory and root theory. And uh, we've, uh, the last three uh, videos I've done have been on uh, the subtelgial and axial location, uh, inaccuracies in root theory, uh, and also uh, my revelation of that uh, subtelgial and axial location allowed us to understand uh, rear foot stability and foot stability at the subtalar joint by understanding as being a balancing of moments and not so much heel verticality being the uh, with, uh, being the stabilizing force that was taught by uh, root theory. So I finished my biomechanics fellowship in uh, July and June 30th of 1985, went into private practice in Sacramento, back, came back home to where I'd grown up in an orthopedic practice in the practice with three other orthopedic surgeons and uh, during that time I was also going back to the podiatry school in San Francisco at the California College of Podiatric Medicine uh, one Saturday a month to uh, teach biomechanics and run a clinic uh, for approximately three to four hours uh, every Saturday uh, every one Saturday a month and uh, during that time I was also working on uh, papers I had my uh, my first paper published on uh, the description of the uh, palpation method. This uh, methods for determination of positional variations of subtelgent axis, which was published in the uh, Journal of American Podiatric Medical Association. This was published in uh, May of 1987, and this is the first description uh, that I made in the literature of this palpation method. And uh, how we could uh, push on the one side of the axis, get supination, push on the other side being uh, um, uh, pronation. And this is uh, was significant in relative to the medial and lateral positions of the subjoint on axis. So that was where I was back in the uh, getting out of my biomechanics fellowship in 1985. Uh, that paper was published soon. That paper was submitted soon after I got out of my uh, fellowship based on my experiences with the palpation method that uh, is, uh, was based on John Weed's um, description to me that he would push on the heel to determine how to make an antipronation orthotic, and when to make an antipronation orthotic or not. This was uh, good up to a point. The problem then was to explain how the foot worked uh, when extra supination and pronation moments were added to a foot that was standing on the ground or relaxed by bipedal stance. So I had a no problems understanding the Blake inverted technique that I had uh, been making since I was a third year student for Rich Blake, who was my biomechanics fellow. That had a highly inverted heel. It was supinate the foot. So the theory and physics behind that was easy understandable because if you add a supination moment uh, to the foot by putting more weight medial on the calcaneus, you increase the lever arm for ground reaction to force to act medial to the subtelgent axis. You increase the magnitude of subtelgent supination moment, and the foot was supinating. This is what we saw during gait, uh, and also was standing on the Blake inverted orthotic that it would hold the foot in a more supinate position and slow down decelerate pronation, accelerate supination during gait. This was fairly easy. The problem came with me trying to describe what happened when I had a foot that was close to maximally pronated or maximally pronated and if I was to put a valgus wedge under the foot for some reason. So I have a maximally pronated foot or a foot that's close to maximally pronated toward the end of the range of motion and what happens to the subtalar joint when I add more pronation moment, external pronation moment. What I saw was we had a problem is that I didn't quite have it figured out how I was going to describe this idea that a maximally pronated foot could be pronated harder. And that that came, that uh, was resolved when I remembered the ideas that I learned in my high school and college physics courses about the concept, the physics concept of rotational equilibrium. And uh, this also led me back to the anatomy lab and to my foot skeleton and looking at feet and understanding that in the maximally pronated position of the subtalar joint. So in the subtalar joint, when we're supinated, the subtalar joint, the sinus tarsi is not occluded, but in the maximally pronated position, 
the sinus tarsi is occluded so that the lateral process of the talus, which is right here, is hitting the floor of the sinus tarsi when it matches and pronates. So there's neutral position. Here's maximum pronation. So there's a maximum pronation position. If I tend to add more pronation moment, it doesn't move, but the forces are still acting internally. But what's happening is as I go from a maximum pronation position to adding increased pronation moment, I increase the force between the lateral process of the talus and the floor of the sinus tarsi of the talus. And once I started to resolve this and do diagrams and drawings of this, I started to realize that this is the key, this is one of the key links that needs to be described in the second paper. And this paper was published, I submitted this paper for publication in 1988, and it's the Rotational Equilibrium Across Subtelligent Axis, uh, published in the January 19, 1989 issue of the Journal of the American Podiatric Medical Association. And this is where I discuss the concept of rotational equilibrium and how important that is. Because when we start looking at rotational equilibrium, we're looking both at adding supination to the system, seeing that the foot will continue to supinate until the pronation moments uh, and the supination moments are exactly equal to each other. But if the foot is already maximally pronated and we add more pronation moments, the foot doesn't move at the subtalar joint because it's already maximum pronated, but what happens is the external forces acting lateral to the axis from the ground, which is increasing the magnitude of subtalar pronation moment, is having to be met by a supination moment within the sinus tarsi. In other words, the compression force of the lateral process, the compression force between the lateral process of the talus here we have lateral process of the talus hitting on the floor of the sinus tarsi produces a compression force and the supination moment is coming from the floor of the sinus tarsi of the calcaneus pressing upward in this direction so we're going upward on the floor on the lateral process of the talus in order to produce a internal supination moment to resist the extra pronation moment and so Newton's law states that for every action, there's an opposite and equal reaction force. And so the extra pronation moment, that is, which I called in the paper on a rotational equilibrium, a residual pronation moment, once this extra pronation moment is added to the system by, let's say, a valgus wedge under the forefoot or rear foot that increases the magnitude of external pronation moment, that has to be internalized within the foot as a increased compression force of the uh, lateral process of the talus smashing down harder into the floor of the sinus tarsi. So this, um, this led me to understand, and in the paper we just talked about this, is that neutral position, neutral subtalar joint biomechanics, where the foot is standing close to the subtalar joint neutral position, where it can easily pronate or supinate relative to that position with either increased magnitudes of external supination moment, which may come from, let's say, a varus wedge underneath the foot, or increased external pronation moments coming, let's say, from a valgus wedge underneath, added underneath the foot, will easily produce either, respectively, either supination of the foot or pronation of the foot away from that neutral position of the subtalar joint in that foot. However, neutral position uh, standing is very different from maximum pronated standing, which we see in a large part of the population, is that in the larger part in a large part of the population, the feet stand maximally pronated, so that yes, we will we can supinate the foot with enough varus wedging underneath the rear foot or forefoot to shift the force more medial uh, relative to the subtalar axis, so we increase the external subtalar joint supination moment which is going to cause supination of the away from the maximum prime position. But if we, we're not going to see an effect if we add, if we're not going to see an effect of eversion of the calcaneus further, when we start taking a maximum prime foot and adding an external subtalar joint pronation moment because it's already maximum pronated. And so the bottom line is in this rotational equilibrium paper, one of the things I wanted to comment and emphasize the fact that a foot that stands close to neutral position within its mid-range range of motion is a very different foot from a foot 
that is maximally pronated. And because the maximally pronated position uh, does not, you cannot pronate the foot further from the maximally pronated position. This is critical to understanding why uh, pay, or feet such as the posterior tibial tinnitus function may also have a pain in the sinus tarsi because the medial axis location is in compressing the sinus tarsi causing the pain in that area. It also helps explain why feet with more medial axes such as a posterior tibial tinnitus function are more difficult to supinate with the orthotic because as that in increase in magnitude of pronation moment from the more medial axis is occurring we have to have a larger magnitude of supination moment coming from the orthotic in order to get the patient out of that maximum primary position because of the large magnitudes of subtelligent pronation moment that are coming from ground reaction force acting across that immediately deviated subtelligent axis. So this rotational equilibrium paper uh, that was published in January of 1989 was quite helpful at uh, being able to uh, allow us to understand not only the uh, how this seesaw effect, which is a, something I used in that paper and is a great way to explain the idea of uh, subtelligent equilibrium, is that we have a seesaw type effect of the pronation moments being on one side of the axis and the supination moments being on another side of the axis, balancing like a, a two, uh, two uh, boys and, or girls sitting on the side of a seesaw, so that when we have that situation, we are going to be producing a uh, supination effect on one side and the pronation effect on the other side, such as I've uh, illustrated here, where we have a uh, we can have a balancing of moments by having different amounts of magnitudes of pronation and supination moments acting on uh, either side of the axis. Uh, and we also I talked about in the paper how important it is to also not only look at ground reaction forces but also look at the muscle moments acting across a medial axis location, a normal axis location, and a lateral axis location, and how that needs to be factored in to determine the internal moments uh, that are coming from, from ligament forces and especially muscle forces that also can resist um, uh, supination or resist uh, uh, pronation uh, motion. In the example in the paper, one of the things I would like to emphasize is that perinus brevis can be, will have to work harder in a lateral axis foot and can produce a perineal tendinopathy because we are having to work that muscle harder because it's the only, the perineal muscles are the only muscles that can produce a strong internal a pronation moment and that the posterior tibial muscle on the other side of the axis being the strongest subtelligent supinator uh, will be overworked in patients that have a more medial axis. And this is something I described in this paper from 1989. And once I started to put this all together between axis location and rotation of the equilibrium, it started opening up a great new world of being explaining the clinical pathology we're seeing and giving rational and coherent biomechanical explanations to the clinical observations we have been making for years and also understand how best to treat uh, the, ortho, uh, the patients with uh, foot orthosis. So in, in summary for this lecture, uh, the critical uh, part that was missing in the early, for me in the, uh, after I got out of my biomechanics fellowship in 1986, 1987, after the publication of my first paper on subtelligent action location was this idea of rotational equilibrium that I started to more fully uh, understand and apply to this special position of the maximally pronated position of the subtelar joint and how that would allow us to understand not only how feet that are, are uh, very pronated are difficult to supinate but also how uh, things like perineal tendinopathy and um, posterior tibial tendinous function can occur as a result of the uh, differing rotational equilibriums of a medial and lateral subtelligent axis position. And then later on, uh, soon after that, uh, I was able to um, use my experiences with the Blake inverted technique to come up with the medial heel skive technique, which we'll be talking about in the next lecture. Thank you.